Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My guest today is Eugenia Zuckerman, an internationally renowned flutist, writer, and former television correspondent. She was the artistic director of the Bravo Vale Valley Music Festival in Colorado for 13 years and the arts correspondent on CBS Sunday Morning for more than 25. She is the author of two novels, two works of nonfiction, and numerous screenplays, articles, and book reviews. Three years ago, Eugenia's family began to notice changes in her cognition. She was unusually forgetful and at times confused in ways that seemed unlike her. Pushed by her family to undergo testing, it was determined that she was suffering symptoms consistent with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. It was around this time that Eugenia took pen to paper and began writing what turned into a lyrical memoir of her experience in real time, coping with the forgetfulness and confusion that come with such a difficult diagnosis. I was unsure how I wanted to approach this conversation. Not knowing Eugenia personally, I wasn't sure how her symptoms would impact her ability to have the type of discussion that I'm used to having and that you're all used to hearing on this program. On that front, I will say that I was impressed at how well Eugenia seemed to remember dates and recount stories when prodded. In fact, there were multiple moments during our conversation that I'd wished I'd been better prepared to discuss instances or anecdotes from her life and career which is so rich and offers so much in terms of inspiration, wisdom, and just good old-fashioned storytelling. In any case, I didn't want to put her on the spot or forget that I was speaking with someone who was exposing herself to me in the most vulnerable circumstances possible. I wanted to be present and open to what and who she was in the moment, and less concerned with plumbing her brain for answers or fishing for stories that, though interesting, would have caused me to miss the larger opportunity to take in the tenderness of the moment. What Eugenia is going through is a variation of what we will all face at some point in our lives, and it's something that is particularly hard to accept for those of us who have been blessed with bountiful lives and the capacities to shape them. We're used to getting our way, but when it comes to our mortality, we're all in the same boat. We all have a common fate to share, and in some odd way, I find this comforting. Maybe it's just me looking for a silver lining, but I don't think so. I'm moved by our humanity. It moves me. And as we move into this new decade full of life, love, relationships, and opportunities, I want us all to focus a little bit more on the things that bring us together and less on the things that set us apart. And with that, I'm honored to bring you my conversation with flutist, writer, and author of Like Falling Through a Cloud, Eugenia Zuckerman. Eugenia Zuckerman, welcome to Hidden Forces. It's a pleasure. 
It's my pleasure having you on. I spent the morning listening to your music. I downloaded like a bunch of albums on iTunes Uh and started on YouTube listening to music of yours. I love classical music, but I don't know the names and stuff. But there was one that was like some concerto flute major thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was beautiful. Well, I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah. How did you come to play the flute? How did that happen? When I was a child, my father was an inventor, and he loved to make music. He played the piano. My mother was a dancer, danced with Martha Graham, and it was a very musical household. And I have to say that when I was in grammar school, there were teachers who taught the kids how to play music on instruments that were donated to the school. And they also had members of an orchestra come to the school and play their instruments. And I heard the flute for the first time, and I was absolutely bowled over. I ran home, and I said, I've just heard the flute, and I want to play the flute. Can I please? Can I please? And my parents were delighted about that. And as I said, in those days, there were instruments that you could take out from the school, and there were teachers who loved to teach. And I was very lucky, because at the age of 10, I was already starting to play and play well. And all through my teenage years, I played. And I had wonderful teachers. So by the time I was, I would say, 10 to 15, those were the formative years for me because that's the time when you learn the quickest and you retain the Mm. best. And I just loved playing the flute. And for me, it was what I would say my other. I could come home from school and I was never lonely because I would go up to my room and take out my flute and it was my best friend. Mm. And it remained my best friend and it still is my best friend. And I feel that I am very lucky that I had the kind of training that I had and that I had the parents who really helped me keep going when Mm. I would say this is too hard, etc. It was parental help that really was the Mm. key. So I'm not an expert in music in any way, so this is a layman's opinion, but the flute seems to be uniquely like ethereal. It's sort of magical. It's ancient also. It's been around forever. And it's also a light companion. You can take it with you. Like you said, it's Were there any other instruments that you were drawn to? Not at all. That's so interesting. (laughs) No. My parents played the piano and my older sister played the piano. And it was just too... I didn't like hitting things. I That's didn't so like, you know, you don't just depress the key. You know, you hit the key sometimes when you're playing the piano. The thing I think that was most of interest to me is that through my own breath and by having my breath go into the flute, I could make sounds of my own. And for me, it was like coloring, Mm. And it became more like coloring. You color the sound. Mm. And you have to find your own way of how to do that. And again, I think for me, it was the fact that the flute became my best friend. Well, there's a poem in the book. I don't have it offhand, but you talk about shaping the air? Shaping the sound. Shaping and the you, sound. you can shape the sound by how much energy you put into your blowing across the embouchure. The embouchure means the place where you make the sound. Mm. So for me, that was just what I've always tried to do, is to make sounds that carry meaning. How much of your training came from being taught, and how much of it was improvisational, just playing around with the instrument on your own? Both, I would say. I played around on the instrument, and I had a rigorous training uh, with a private teacher, Mm -hmm. but also rigorous training at the schools that I went to. I went to public schools. Mm. 
And then by the time I went to college, I went to Barnard College. Um, I had a teacher in New York who was one of the greats, and he was very encouraging to me. Mm. And his name was Julius Baker, mm. and he was amazing. And some of the greatest flutists have come from his studio. Mm. So I do want to talk more about this, and I think we will, but I want you to take us back, if you can, to the beginning of this journey that led to the book that you've written And I I assume that would be around the time of your diagnosis? Well, I was forced into a diagnosis Mm -hmm. because my daughters kept saying to me, what's the matter with you? You're speaking strangely. You're repeating yourself. And I kept saying, I'm perfectly fine. And then they finally said, okay, it's time. You are going to go to the hospital and get tested. Mm -hmm. And my younger daughter came with me and I went and Everyone seemed so much older than I was, Mm. but it was a very nice and easy way to sit in a room and then be called in. My daughter came with me. The doctor who talked to me was very nice and very bright, and we talked about many things, and she decided that it would be the thing to do to be tested. And the first testing that I was taken to was CAT scan. They decided that they needed to have a CAT scan. And when at the end of my meeting with this woman, I went down for my CAT scan, I wasn't scared at all. I was kind of excited. And I must have been one of the very few people who got into the CAT scan and loved it. Because I loved hearing sounds that I had never heard in my life. Mm. I think most people are pretty frightened of a CAT scan. Mm. But I came... MRI, maybe. Yeah, I think it was an MRI. MRI, yeah, Yeah, trust me, I I know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, you, you said it in the book, but I also, I've been in the same situation. And I remember in one of your poems, you were writing about this when you went to the doctor. And before you went down to get the MRI, she administered a test she tested your cognition in the room. That was the other way around. Oh, the other I, way around. I went okay. to the cognitive place the second time I came to the hospital. Sur- the, 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 the first College time. for Physicians and Surgeons. Yes, and, yeah. And oh, up in Columbia. Up at Columbia, right. So the first time that I was tested, it was for an MRI. Mm-hmm. And then it, I was told that I had to come back to do some cognitive learning. Mm-hmm. No, I, I've taken those tests too. We've talked about this. You know, my audience knows this, brought this up many times now in different interviews for different reasons, but I had dementia and it was very hard taking those tests. I mean, the, what you described, your feelings were the feelings I had, frustration, fear, and a, just a desire to just stop. You know, there's something else that comes across in your work, which is interesting. And I, you know, you're very successful and maybe that I think there's a correlation between being successful and maybe sometimes being hard on yourself. Well, I think that someone who's driven, who has a goal, a constant goal, you never really reach your goal. It's constant. And I think that I am hard on myself. I've always been hard on myself. As a kid, I remember hitting myself on the head when I couldn't do something. And I just wanted to be able to... Do something instantly. Give the right answers on that test. Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. So when the day was over, when the tests were over, this was when? What year was this? How far back? This is about three years. Three years ago. Three three and and a half half years years ago. ago. And then at that point, you went home and they didn't give you a diagnosis yet. You were going to find out the results of the tests and everything else. And you talked about actually being relieved that you didn't have to think about it. But you began writing... After you came back from the doctor, was that when you started writing? After the very first time I went to the hospital and my daughter was with me, we took the subway downtown to where I lived, and I went up to my apartment, and I sat down at my desk, and I stared at the wall for a while, Mm. and for some reason I picked up a pen and pencil and simply started writing. Mm. And I didn't have any goal. I just wrote And it all came out in poetry. I don't really know why. I have written a lot of poetry, but I had not tried to write a sort of story. But this just all flowed. And I didn't tell anyone about it for about, I would say, a month. And I asked my younger daughter if I could 
sent it to her because I seem to be writing something and I'm not sure it's worth it. And uh, <laughs> she came back to me almost instantly and she said, Mom, this is really very special. Just mm. keep going. And that helped me. I realized, hmm, maybe this is something. Hmm. And even at that point, I hadn't realized this is poetry. This is something that is unusual for me to do, especially in the long version, to keep going. And I found that every day it made me feel stronger, better. There's a certain clarification hmm. that happens, and you must find this too in your writing, that by the very action of writing, because it's a movement forward, mm. I think that that helps you kind of figuring out at the same time that you're writing. Well, I think you're very courageous for having done this, because to be honest with you, I did write about my experience, but only after, long after it was over. Well, that makes sense to me. <laughs> you know, I do not know why I was driven to do this mm. every day. I think... I had a humongous amount of fear. Yeah. And I think perhaps by writing daily, it made me realize, oh, okay, I am still someone who is able to connect to words and to express myself. What were you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Well, what I was afraid of was that I would lose all cognitive ability and lose my ability to connect to people because we need to be able to express ourselves. Mm -hmm. I knew that I never wanted to stop making music. And by that time, I was the artistic director of the Clarion Concerts in Columbia County. So I was already in a position of not only making music, but being someone who was in charge of a musical organization. So I had a lot on my mind. And I think by writing, it simply helped me organize myself. Hmm. You said Clarion County. That's in upstate New York? Yes, Clarion Concerts in Columbia County mm. is the actual mm. name of this organization. And it's over 50 years old, started by someone who went to Europe and brought back a lot of wonderful music. And so that is how all of it happened. And uh, the man who started Clarion Concerts now 60 years ago, who is no longer on the planet, Newell Jenkins, started this. Mm. And it has always been an ongoing situation. And I'm very lucky to have met people who wanted me to continue working with them and to have concerts, which we do. You did a segment with CBS Sunday Morning and you were actually for how many years a curator of content there, a producer? No, I was always the artistic Music. correspondent for them. So I was the person who got to do the wonderful stuff, like interview the famous people, like Judy Collins, like Paul McCartney, to so many people. Yeah. And that was wonderful. What was that like? It was great. I found that all the people that I sat across from were interesting, were, you know, wanted to be there, wanted to be known, and... Wanted to be known, when you say wanted to be known generally, or they wanted to be known specifically and be there with you on CBS Sunday Morning? I can't speak for how they wanted to <laughs> feel about me, but I can tell you that I wanted really to find out who's this guy mm. sitting across from me. Okay, so he's famous, and let's talk. Who were some of the most interesting characters? I have to say every single one of them. Judy and Collins seems like she'd be pretty interesting. Judy Collins was a friend of mine even really? before I was on CBS Sunday Morning. So I knew her very well. And she's one of the most wonderful people. Mm. And that I don't know if it's easiest to talk with someone who you know best or whether it's someone who you don't really know. Mm. But I That's am... It's interesting. I've had sometimes people on the show that I know rather well. And actually, I feel like it's easier for me to have people that I don't know that well. Maybe I get more excited because there's so much more to learn. Right. I think that that's the case, too. I know that Judy Collins was just one of many people. And 
I am sort of embarrassed that I don't remember as many people as mm. names, etc. Well, Paul but, McCartney, for example. <laughs> right. Well, I had never met him before, and there I was sitting that across, had to be across so from him. So cool. He was very cheeky. <laughs> and very, very adorable. And he was there because he had written a serious piece. And he was terrific. And he talked a lot about his father and his father's interests in music. Wow. So to be across, right across from him was fun and thrilling. And I think anyone who says, yes, I will have an interview, they're not wanting you not to like them. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think I got the best of most of the people I talked with. Mm. Did you have a certain strategy or way of coming to the interview in order to make it better? Or did you have, let's say, a way of putting yourself into a certain mindset before you sat down with... Did you have a ritual or something like that? I didn't have a ritual. I did my work. Mm. I looked up everything I could about the person I was going to talk to. I wrote down questions that I would be asking, and I didn't have a piece of paper. Mm. It was like you know, meeting you and talking with you and finding out who you are. That's the way I approached it. Mm. it. It helped a great deal that Sunday morning was already an entity. Mm. No, that's not true. Here's the deal. Now I remember. I got a phone call <laughs> quite early. I was still at Barnard. I got a phone call from Shad Northshield, and he said, my name is Shad Northshield. I have a TV show, and you're going to be on it, and you're going to <laughs> You're say, going to be on it. You're just, going to be on it. He didn't it. even ask you. No, he didn't tell me who he was or anything. He said, this is, no, he did. He said, I am Shad Northshield, and I have started a program called Sunday morning, and you're going to be on it, and you're going to be talking to people in the arts, and you'll have a salary, and you're going to say yes. You're going to say yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he so, was one of the great people. He was just so charismatic, and when he was mad, I learned what mad was. You know, really? He really could tell you off. But he also really would tell you this was terrific. So I have to say that Sunday morning is still ongoing, as you know, because mm -hmm. I was very thrilled that they wanted to do a piece about me and what has gone on. So you were there from the beginning. So CBS Sunday Morning, I think, began in 1979. I think their first episode was in 79. You were there around that time? Yes. I was maybe uh, there for the second or third time. Amazing. And I had no idea what I was doing. And that was an amazing time still to be on television. You know, I think television used to be more magical than it is now. You know, now it doesn't have that sense of inaccessibility. Right. It used to be really, if you saw someone from television, it was, you know, you're like you were seeing a god or something. Right. Well, I have to say that Charles Kuralt, who was the executive producer, and he was the person who had all of the ideas and the person who was sort of the face of CBS Sunday morning. And it was just wonderful to be able to do what I had not even in my mind thought I wanted to do, and that was to be able to not only sit and talk to people, but fly out to Minnesota to find out about such and such an artist. Mm. And it was a great privilege to be on that show. What is the instrument that they begin the show with? There's a sound like... It's a trumpet. It's a trumpet. Yeah. Did you ever meet Don Hewitt? Yes. What was he like? I don't have much of a recollection. Yeah. I know I met him, but not as well as some yeah. of the others. That was amazing that a program like that could have been as successful as it was, both 60 Minutes and Sunday Morning. You know, I think television has changed a lot, not necessarily for the better. And it's wonderful that there are still programs like that that endure. And I know so many people that watch CBS Sunday Morning because they like watching something that's pleasant and shows the brighter side of humanity. Well, I remember that they had the brighter side of humanity, but they also had pieces on things that were frightening mm. and not so happy. Mm. And that's one of the things I really appreciated about it. It was real life, real people, mm. real things happening. And I felt that you know, as I traveled around, I can remember going to a Holiday Inn out somewhere, and a man who was sweeping the floor 
came over to me and he said, aren't you Eugenia Zuckerman? I said, yes, I am. And he said, I loved that piece that you did about Tchaikovsky or what. And I'm watching this guy who is sweeping the floor and Sunday morning had made inroads. How does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel that music and art is so important. Mm. And I also remember being somewhere in Europe and having an outdoor meal somewhere and someone popped his head up and said, are you Eugenia Zuckerman? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, I listen to you every Sunday. <laughs> and there we were in the middle of somewhere. That's so nice. And I do think that it's changed. And it has changed because everyone wants something faster and quicker. We used to have 12-minute segments. Mm. And by the time I left, it was down to six Mm. And also, one of the things for me was real learning experience, was going with a group of people, a sound man, a f- the photographer, others, etc., and we would be together with people who didn't really know each other, but we got to know each other, and to make something together. So you had like a regular crew that you worked with? It wasn't always regular. We all mixed around. Mm. It depended on who needed what, mm. etc. And I was astounded to find out that I'd been there for more than 25 years. And then I was told that people no longer wanted classical music. Hmm. Well, um, I love classical music, I must say. And again, I'm embarrassed at how little I know about music. And it's interesting, when I was growing up, it was even more the case. I was more into movies. In the last few years, it's like my ears have opened up like you know, like a car engine. It took some miles for the engine to open. And it's like, now I can hear things. And I really just loved listening to your music, to you playing the flute this morning. Oh, thank you. And, you know, that prods me. I want to ask you about this. I might as well ask about it now. Your husband, how did the two of you meet? I think I had this idea in my head that you met at one of your concerts. But how important was music to how you came together? Very important. Mm -hmm. I had already had two husbands before. The first one who was a famous musician, the second one who was a screenwriter and movie maker. So that area felt very comfortable for me. And I met my husband, Dick Novick, through a friend having decided that I wanted to spend time by myself in the woods up near Tanglewood for a summer just by myself, I got there and got a phone call from a friend of mine who said, I know this wonderful guy. He loves music. He does this. He does that. And he wants to meet you. He's going to call you. And I said, no, no, no. It's just way too soon. (laughs) And she said, get over it. And I went to Tanglewood the next day. I think we spoke first, and I had no idea what he looked like, really. But he said, meet me at this place, etc. And I went at intermission, we met. And I took one look at this just fabulous-looking man. Swashbuckling. Swashbuckling, yes. (laughs) (laughs) With most beautiful blue eyes and a smile. And he said to me, I've brought a beautiful young woman with me. And I thought, oh, my God, this guy is weird. But then he took me to the beautiful young woman who was his beautiful young daughter, Uh. one of his beautiful young daughters. (laughs) And that was funny. And then I knew we, we had to go back in after the first half was over. And I saw where he was sitting. And I listened to the music, but I watched him. I could see the back of his head, and his foot was going exactly where it should have gone at the right (laughs) moment. And I sat there saying to myself, I'm going to marry this man. Wow. And I forced him into it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, that reminds me a little bit of a story recounted by Jane Fonda about how she first met Ted Turner. So Ted Turner had supposedly, according to Jane Fonda, called Jane right after her divorce. And she does this impression of like, oh, hello, this is Bill. You know, I heard you're getting divorced or whatever. <laughs> and she says, no, 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 it's too soon. Call him back in six months. And he called her back in six months on the dot. And he took her out on a date and she was just, it was instant attraction from the very beginning. So I wanted to ask you again. So you, you were on CBS Sunday morning. It filmed you up in this beautiful farm that you live at now full time. But tell me a little bit about this place. How long have you been going there? As soon as I met Dick. That was his house? Yes, it was his house. He introduced me to his house. It was wintertime. 
and I think you had two dogs at the time, and it was snowy, and we walked up a icy hill, and I said, what's that? And he said, what? And I pointed, and it, it was blood all over the snow. And he said, take the dogs, go inside. Another bear. <laughs> no, but he oh. <laughs> said, take the dogs, get them inside. And I said, what are you going to do? You're not going to kill this creature. And he said, I have to. So here I was, this person from New York. We don't think about guns or anything. And I have just met this man, uh, <laughs> and I have his two dogs, and he's going to shoot an animal on the snow. So it was... Uh, that more was than you bargained for. More than I bargained for. Was it a bear? No, it was a bobcat. A bobcat. Yes. Because the three of us were discussing in the green room earlier about the uh, presence of bears on the property. You know, I, I think there's a growing fascination among my generation and younger about the wilderness and hunting and things like this. And I think that maybe it's just a, a cyclical thing. This always happens every so many generations or whatnot, I don't know. Or maybe it's also driven in part by the record level of people living in urban environments. The... Well, there's that, but I will tell you, this was a rabid bobcat. Yeah. <laughs> and he knew, my husband knew it was rabid, and I didn't. I thought, oh, poor little thing. So it was an eye-opener to the world outside of New York mm. for me. So what was the first thing that you wrote when you sat down to write? Which one was the first poem? Was it straight from the beginning? It was absolutely from the beginning. I, um, I'd i love for you to read like Falling Through a Cloud because that is a beautiful... Is that the first thing you wrote? Yes. That's incredible. Yeah. But I also want to say that I had no idea, you know, what I was going to be writing, but I knew the title. I knew like Falling Through a Cloud. And the reason I knew the title was because my mother died at 103, and that was three years ago. So it was just my, I knew that my mother was cloudy. Mm. And I knew that sometimes she would wake up and be very bright. Mm. And so I always felt that her waking up was like, her head was a empty coconut. I used to think of it that way. And mm. for some reason, the way she was able to wake up was to let the insides drip down into mm. the coconut until something came out. And for some reason, I do not remember the exact moment, but I knew I was going to call it like falling through a cloud. Hmm. You know, that also resonates. I mean, the cloud metaphor, I thought of when I was going through this and forgetting and it was getting harder and harder to remember things and recognize people. And it felt very much like a fog sort of a fog had descended and it was just growing thicker and thicker and it was hard to see through and I had to make all these different efforts to see more clearly, more coping mechanisms or way of doing it. But this was one of many poems in the book that I found relatable. I'd love if you could read it. Like falling through a cloud. Sometimes when I wake up, it's dark. Where am I? Sometimes I know and sometimes I have no idea. So I let the night spirits wrap around me, and they whisper to me, Don't think. You will remember. I lie very still, and then, suddenly, like falling through a cloud, I know I am here. Hmm. What does that capture? What are you describing when you say that? I actually do think of falling through a cloud. I do think of floating. And that probably comes from seeing my mother sort of float above her bed, that feeling. Sometimes when I would go in to see her, it was as if she was somewhere else. Mm. But I think perhaps it's something that we all go through, and that is that there's something going around in your brain, and you're trying to grasp it, and you have to fall through something to wake up. Mm. And that's part of what I think I felt when I decided to call it like falling through a cloud. Also, the part about night spirits wrapping you, I found it resonated with me. And is some of this about learning to let go? Is that part of that process of not, you know, in the specific case of trying to remember something, not trying to force yourself into remembering it, but just letting it be what it is and letting things come to you? Absolutely. This was something I became aware of right in the beginning of writing the book, because I know that if you squeeze something too hard, you're going to hurt it. Mm. 
and you won't be able to express yourself in the way that you can if you you not make yourself but help yourself to relax. Mm. I think that every time I have tried to make something happen, I have failed because I have tried too hard mm. or have pushed too hard. Have you, I guess this also kind of goes back to something we mentioned earlier, which is that, you know, a lot of people that are successful, they tend to be type A personalities. They go getters. They know what they want. They chase it. If they want something, they make it happen. And... I think also just part of either getting older or confronting illness or challenges sometimes, in my experience at least, requires learning a new skill of acceptance or surrender to the moment or circumstances. Is that something that you've found to be true? Have you grown in that sense in terms of your own compassion for yourself and for being more understanding with, let's say, your shortcomings or whatever it is in the moment that you're dealing with? I'm not really sure about that, but I can tell you that, can I read another poem that is involved in what we're talking about? Absolutely, yeah. This one is called Marbles. Hmm. Maybe mine are lost, or maybe they're rolling around in my head looking for a place to land, or maybe not. My daughters tell me to get tested. Tested for what, I ask, even though I know for what, but it's for what I don't want to know. So I let the marbles roll around in a swirl of distracting colors because I don't want to listen to them, the daughters, because if I hear them, I will be very afraid. And this mother cannot be that mother, not ever, never. And I think that is a poem about my passion for my daughters. I don't think I was a very clingy mother, Mm. And I adore my daughters and my granddaughters now. But I think that I just forced myself through feelings of inadequacy. And I think most mothers feel inadequate from time to time. But I wanted this feeling of marbles, etc. I liked the feeling of how marbles roll and how mm. the colors come, etc. Mm. For describing the way in which your mind feels and your, your memories? No, just I think more of, I don't even know, remember now why I thought because I wanted Because it to... does conjure something that I feel like I understand it. I mean, again, it's just like falling through a cloud, right? It's the marble is sort of just rolling around, just like falling through a cloud. Mm -hmm. It's just sort of almost effortless. I think effortless, but I also think purposeful. Mm. I think that when things are rolling around and you're trying either to stop it from rolling around or be fascinated with it, I think the whole period of when I was writing this book, I felt that things were in motion. Mm -hmm. And mm. I think that, come to think of it, I think that every time I've written a book... I have wanted that sense of keep going, keep going. And I have had times when I've been writing a book and I have felt it's not working and it's not working. Mm. And once or twice I actually have, after a lot of work on a book, I gave it up. Mm. So I guess the marbles is something that you want. When you're trying to do something, you have to let things roll until you're able to kind of control it. Mm. That's also uh, relatable. We did an episode recently. We haven't released it. This will come out first with David Epstein, who's an author who's written some great books. He was a journalist for Sports Illustrated. And uh, I believe it was with him that we talked about this. But Sometimes you can put an enormous amount of work into something and it just doesn't work out the way that you thought it would mm -hmm. or that you wanted it to, but then it turns out that something more beautiful comes out of that, mm -hmm. you know? I think you can get stuck. Yeah. You can get stuck on something that you really think is going to work. And for most of my writing life, I have always told myself it is not acceptable to give this up. You just have to keep going. And once or twice, I really have given up on something that I, at first, was really excited about. So that kind of brings up again something that I mentioned earlier, which I want to see, maybe I can ask it again, which is something in my own life that I realized as I got older and went through certain experiences is the difference between quitting or giving up and surrender or acceptance. Mm -hmm. 
How have you dealt with this at this stage in your life, what you're dealing with, what you're coping with? How have you navigated this? I think I've navigated it in the best way I have writing anything, and that is honesty. Hmm. Everything I wrote is extremely honest. I didn't make anything up. It might have come from something in my background, etc., but I, I never gave it up. And I think that by being positive, particularly now that I have a diagnosis, it's a diagnosis of death, but we all have diagnosis of death, and I don't want to sort of get away from what we're saying, but I remain positive. And maybe I remain positive because this is the happiest time of my life. Talk to me about that. It doesn't seem as if it should be, but it is because I have a great love in my life. I have extraordinary children I have friends and family. I have animals I adore. I have everything I need around me. Do you think you have a deeper appreciation now for those things than you did before? Far deeper. Mm. Far deeper. Do you think that's why? Maybe, and also maybe because I know I'll have to leave them and that they will have to leave me. Mm. And I do wake up every morning and think to myself, thank you. Mm. It's really Your good sense to of be gratitude here. is huge. Huge. Huge sense of gratitude, except for my dog, Lucy. <laughs> I absolutely adore her. And she comes up to my room when I'm practicing. And if she doesn't like the piece, she puts her paws over her ears and shakes her head and walks off as if I have pooped in the room. Really? Seriously. So there's certain pieces that she likes and certain pieces she doesn't like. Exactly. That's yeah. so interesting. So for anyone that's listening who either is going through this or more likely who has a family member that they love, a mother, a father, a sister, a brother who is going through this, whether it's... Alzheimer's, whether it's the natural process of aging and forgetting, what advice can you give or what would you hope that your work and your presence here today can convey? I would just say to everyone, live every day. And by live every day, I don't mean, you know, wake up and brush your teeth, but, you know, it is such a gift to be alive. And you, as someone who has had similar problems that I have had, I would imagine you have that same feeling. It is just, whoa, my eyes are open. I am living. I have that sense every morning. Well, it was, who was the actress on Saturday Night Live? Greta, no. I think it was Gildna Radner who said... I'm forgetting now who mentioned this on one of our episodes, but she said something like cancer is amazing except for the downside or something like that. I can't remember exactly how she said it, but it's true. I mean, there's so much gratitude and perspective that you gain from that type of experience. And I can imagine that there are many beautiful moments with your husband in the farm surrounded by nature or when your daughters come or when you see your grandchildren, you know? Every day I wake up hoping that I will still be here so that I can connect with these people who mean so much to me. And I don't think every day about death, but I am aware. I am aware every day that I probably, you know, it's not going to be all that much longer. But I also tell myself every day, you could step off a curb and get hit by a car probably faster than mm. the time you're going to die. There's also something interesting that happens when you're present, which is that your life extends it in a sense, because time, there's a yawn, there's a chasm that grows. Mm -hmm. And again, that's to the point of living in the moment. Eugenia, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces 
Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.